this webinar on governance and clusters with Madeline Smith from Glasgow School of Art and TCI Network and Dr. Mariana Prisa, a Managing Director with a Food Innovation Australia Limited and also a Oceana Chapter Lead with TCI Network. So by way of introduction to Madeline, Madeline specialises in strategy and evaluation for clusters and triple helix collaborations. At GSA, she leads the research and enterprise strategy for the Innovation School, as well as designing programmes to build on the innovative capacity of businesses, public sector organisations and communities. Madeline has led large strategic policy on innovation for regional development and continues to work internationally on supporting the cluster policy and evaluation. She is an active member of the Global TCI Network and leads their international working group on cluster evaluation. Uh, Dr. Mariana Prika, uh, to introduce Mariana, is an enthusiastic visionary who focuses on entrepreneurship and innovation to deliver commercial value. Mariana sits on the boards and advisory groups for cooperative research centres, universities, research and industry organisations and businesses, where she leverages her 20 plus years of research and commercial experience in food and agribusiness, including advanced materials and minerals. Currently, Mariana is leading FIAL, a national and industry-led organisation established by the Australian Government to drive innovation and business growth for the 180,000 firms in the food and agribusiness sector. FIAL is committed to, cluster committed to a cluster governance journey 12 months ago and will share that journey today. As we build up our own clustering capability, we need to consider cluster governance. What do we mean by cluster governance? What is needed to set up good cluster governance? And what is the difference between cluster governance and corporate governance? So we look forward to starting the conversation with you this morning. A few ground rules for today. Uh, Madeline and Mariana will complete their presentations. Please post questions, comments uh, you have in the chat function as we move through the presentations. For now, everybody is on mute. The, session, the presentations today are being recorded. I will hand you over to Madeline and we will get the webinar underway. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks, Cloda. Nice to be here and to be working with you um, uh, on this um, interesting, interesting area. I think it is something that uh, is increasingly important and, and is often in conversations around, around clusters. So um, I'll see if I can get my slides going. There you go. So I suppose what I'm going to do today is probably pose more questions than I'm going to give answers, but maybe it's something about these are the areas where you might want to consider um, how your cluster is, is, is um, delivering or how your cluster is addressing some of these areas. And the key things I want to talk about is, you know, if we're talking about good cluster governance, what is it? What do we mean by it? And how do we, how do we go about doing it? How do, we, how do we put it in place? A key question, I think, is what's different for a cluster board? Clusters are, are, are strange animals in some ways, so their cluster board and the good governance for a cluster board, there's something slightly different about it, so let's pull out some of those key areas. And thinking about if you want a highly effective board, which you do, what are the skills and qualities that you need? So start to think about some of those things as you, you establish your cluster board. One of the key questions, I suppose, is what is the role of the board? Um, uh, the, often it's said that you know boards of director, directors are responsible for the governance of their companies, the governance of their organisations. Well, what do we mean by, by governance? It's not just running a company. There's something more about being uh, what we mean by governance. So if we think about a role of a board, actually, I always, I always think this is a, a, a useful prompt for us. Why is it important? It's because we set the direction as a board. Um, as the Chinese proverb says, a fish rots from the head. So you need to make sure that board is functioning well and really leading um, the organization. And for those of you who are interested, that is a portion of stargazy pie in the picture, which is a very, very tasty um, a meal from the southwest of England. So let's think a, bit, a little bit about the, the role of a board and good governance brings together four of those core B, uh, board roles, key board roles. Probably the most important is formulating the strategy, so setting that future direction. That strategic role is really where the board must play its strongest card. 
there's obviously an accountability role for the assets and the resources, the funding that you're getting. That stewardship role as well is very important for the board. There is, and this is very important for a, um, a cluster board, a social aspect, because it's all about the way that, um, that, that the culture is established. And particularly for clusters, it's around the collaborative nature of those social connections. And obviously as a board, you're given lots of information. Um, and so there is a sense-making aspect to, to try and make, uh, to understand about that information because you want to be holding your executive colleagues to account about the delivery against the strategy. So there is a, a, a key aspect about assessing that information to assure ourselves that we are getting the delivery towards that strategy. So why is good governance important? It's not just in cluster circles, it's actually um, increasingly across, um, across business environments um, it, because there is an increased interest in more than financial aspects, particularly for responsible investors who are interested in what's the performance around environmental, social governance, governance factors, as well as the financial factors. Um, so there's quite a lot of evidence that actually it's good for business because you, you are looking after your organization's long-term viability by putting in good, good governance structures. And there's a lot of interest in, in it from across the business world who are sharing good practices, who's doing um, good governance well, and how can we learn from them as, a, as organizations? So it's not just clusters that are talking about it. It is important for investors. For clusters, I think I suppose it's also important for funders. They want to know <clears throat> that their investment in these um, interventions is, is being managed and delivered well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Auditors as well, as well as the financial aspects, also look at what's the governance performance. And most importantly, stakeholders and cluster members want to know that the investment they're giving whether that be financial or in kind, time and, and, and personal resources is being led appropriately through good governance. So it is important for a whole, whole range of, of stakeholders. I suppose it's worth just touching on why, what's special about cluster boards because they are, they are slightly different. And it's worth therefore going back to what are clusters all about? And it's bringing all the actors in the innovation system together. So it's not just one strand, it's all those different perspective. And most importantly, it's corralling around that, that common agenda. So how can we bring those collective assets and capabilities to be able to really achieve some cluster goals? And that reflects, I think, the, the changing natures of organizations. Previously, it was maybe quite predictable and command and control was the, was the modus operandi for many, many organizations. But that's no longer the case. We're, we're living in a world of huge complexity and uncertainty. And what's being seen is that those empowered networks, those webs of connections, are the organizations that are more flexible, more adaptable, and able to take advantage of those new environments. And that's where clusters fit. So they are moving towards the, the, the areas where we're seeing organizational structures move. So it's a very positive time for that, but it takes a different type of, um, of board to be able to manage that organization. So as we know, clusters are open and collaborative. They're all about sharing knowledge, learning from each other, and most importantly, doing together what cannot be achieved alone. So what is it by corralling around that common agenda that we can achieve, whereas me sitting in isolation in my individual organization, I would never be able to do it on my own. So what can we do together that cannot be achieved alone? And so revisiting then from a, from a board point of view, what's special about cluster boards? The, the key thing is that role of collaboration. You're trying to build that board to corral around that common agenda and build a collective strategy. So it's not just a single organization taking forward their, their ambitions. It's that how can we corral all those different perspectives together to do together what we cannot do alone. And as a result, there's, there's a real role in being inclusive and diverse, bringing those different perspectives and building on that collective capability for those areas of common ambition. The other thing is, well, is the key role around, uh, around um, board roles is around risk. 
and assessing risk and understanding risk. And by working <coughs> collaboratively, there is an opportunity for sharing risk. By doing things collectively, we're sharing the risk of taking those innovative steps. So from a cluster board point of view, we need to understand that shared collective risk. We're just drilling into a little bit about the roles of the uh, role of a board and reflecting therefore on what's different about a cluster. A key one, as I said earlier, was about setting the vision and the strategy. What's the direction that we're heading within this organization and are we articulating that clearly? The second area is, um, holding to account, to, so working with our executive colleagues to say, are the, is, are the areas where we're delivering, delivering effectively, and also are they taking us towards that strategy or have we got distracted down a, down a side alley? Are we really focusing our limited resources on the areas to have the biggest impact for our strategy? And the board has a big role about holding to account. We talked about um, risk and looking at what's the risk, whether that be a financial risk, or a reputational risk, the risk around innovation. So looking at what are the strategic risks, not the day-to-day -day risks, but the strategic risks that the organization faces in delivering its strategy. And how can we put in place mitigating factors to address those risks? There's obviously the financial accountability. Clusters, as with other organizations, will be getting funding from different sources and from members. So how are we um, being accountable for the financial resources that we, we are being given to, to show that we are managing and effectively using those financial resources? We talked about the social aspect. There's a real, um, uh, a, a real social aspect in engaging and also communicating with our stakeholders, our shareholders, our members. Um, so being transparent in those communications about what is it we're doing to achieve the, the strategy that we've put in place. And we, there's also a role for the board to ensure that we've got the right skills and the qualities, both on the board, and I'll come to that in a, in a minute, but also for the organisation. You can't be holding executive colleagues to account about delivery if we haven't managed our resources to give them the right skills and qualities within the staff to deliver. So there is, there is a, a, an assessment, therefore, for the board about have we got those right skills and qualities for the board and for the organisation. And a key thing is around setting the culture. The leadership team, the role of the board is to, is to show by the way you operate and behave that this is the way we want the organisation to deliver, to operate and behave. So it's what we do, not what we say. Okay, so if you want to have a high functioning board, it's more than just getting good people with goodwill around the board table. There will be a lot of people who will be engaged in becoming part of cluster boards and will be very enthusiastic um, and will be highly committed to it. But what is it that we can do to try and make that, uh, that highly functioning board? And it is about bringing those different perspectives together and building that effective board, which takes time and takes a bit of effort. I think it's worth reflecting on what makes a good non-executive director on a board. Many of the people who you will engage in your cluster boards will be highly experienced at running their own companies or being at senior levels within their organizations, whether that be research in universities or, or public sector. So they all have good experience at senior management and executive leadership of, a, of an organization, but a non-exec is something slightly different you're wanting your non-execs to bring their different perspectives and experience, and you don't want them all to be the same. So you do want to spread, but there needs to be an understanding about the, the difference between a non-exec non -exec responsibility and an executive. So the non-exec is that very much that strategic um, board roles, looking at what that longer term strategy and, and vision is, and how are we delivering against it. The executive roles, which many will be very experienced about delivery and really trying to get it done. And so there is a need for non-execs, I think, to focus on the strategic, to make sure that we are, we are understanding what that long-term vision and strategy and that we have the capability in place to be able to deliver it and then holding the executive colleagues to account for actually operationally delivering it. That's a difficult thing to do. Sometimes you just want to say, move out the way and let me show you how to do it. That's not 
the role of a non-exec because that's not your day-to-day -day role. And so that you need to do that with a mixture of challenge and support. So there's challenge in, are we getting the information we need to show we're delivering against strategy? Have we got the right um, delivery mechanisms to, to, to achieve our vision and goals? But also support, say, well, are there ways that we can support the delivery towards our strategy? Are, is there more resources needed? Are there more connections needed? How can we support the executive colleagues to actually deliver? So it's that interesting balance between challenge and support, which is a bit like coaching in some ways, um, because you're not actually doing, you're working with the colleagues for them to, to be able to deliver. The best description I heard about it was that non-execs should have noses in but fingers out, as in they should be very interested and engaged and, um, and uh, um, understand the, operation, the, the, uh, the strategic direction and the organization, but they're not in there fiddling in the day-to-day. -day. So they're leaving that delivery, that management level to the executive colleagues. It's also worth looking about board skills. You want a diversity of board skills. You might want different ones to, to, to bring different skills and experience at different times. You may want someone with a financial knowledge or a legal knowledge. Definitely you'll want some credible industry knowledge on your, on your board. But then there may be some other aspects that you want with particular expertise. It might be a key stakeholder, maybe someone with key understanding about change and innovation. So think about the skills and experience that would make up a really good board. You don't have to have them all. Think about the needs of the, uh, the organization. Um, and, and so think about those that skills matrix in some ways. So yes, you want to spread across the, the triple helix and those, those different perspectives, but how well does your board cover the, the key skills and experience that you need at this particular stage? I think it's also worth revisiting that cluster board specifics. So it's about those collaborative leadership skills. Um, it's a, and I love this quote, particularly around it being a strategic behavior and that what you need is trust, transparency and respect. And if you can build trust, transparency and respect in the way that you operate your cluster boards, then you will be a long way down the line at these collaborative leadership skills. Board members bring a whole range of different hats. Each of us individually doesn't come with just one role. We all bring different hats to the board. So it may be what you're, from your experience, from, from your previous work, from the companies you've led or the organizations you've worked in. Um, it may be that you have particular skills or qualities. You may come from a financial or legal background. You may have particular expertise in, um, in engaging with, with um, industry colleagues. You may be a particular representative voice from a particular geography or from a, from a subgroup of your sector that you want to have engaged in your board. And you want to build that, that some of those diversity aspects so that everybody isn't the same. So you do want those different perspectives. But each person will come with more than one hat. So how do you build that collective board against individual agendas? And I think the key thing is what's the cluster agenda? What's the vision and strategy for the cluster that you're trying to achieve? And then building on those collaborative leadership skills to be able to deliver it together. So it is way more than just being a lobby, particularly if you are coming from, a, from an area which is a representative voice or you're bringing a particular area. It's more than just lobbying for your corner. It's saying, well, how can I bring my different hats towards that collective challenge that collective ambition. It's also worth thinking about the fact that that needs change over time. When you're first establishing a cluster organization, you'll need different things when you are a mature cluster organization that is wanting to move to the next stage or wanting to diversify or whatever it is that the next growth stage might be for, for the cluster. So this is something you need to do on a regular basis to say, what are the new needs now for this next stage of delivery. So just um, finally, I'm just going to um, uh, rattle through those a bit. And as I say, I've posed more questions than I've probably answered. Um, and, and hopefully talking with uh, Mariana afterwards, she'll give um, a, a few more um, examples of where 
the, the FIAL has actually tried to address some of those questions and the changes that they've seen. But a couple of things for me, just to leave you with those last questions to think about when you're delivering your strategic ambitions and building good cluster governance is, have you got strong governance within your, your organization to help you know that you're delivering? Have you got that good board balance, both of skills and, ex and experience? Are you spending your board time looking at strategy and strategic risk, not in the minutiae and the detail, because that's not the role of the board. So it's how can you keep it in strategic? And as a result, have you got the right skills and experience at the right time on your board, or is it something that needs to be refreshed? And have you got the right structures and processes in place, both for reporting to, to wider um, uh, members and stakeholders in a transparent way, but also have we got the right structures and processes to be able to deliver? So those are the things that you should be really considering about good governance for, for cluster delivery. That's uh, um, uh, all I'm going to take you through for now. Hopefully, as I say, Mirana will be uh, able to, to give some concrete examples of this is what it means when you're living with a cluster, but that is some of our experience and reflections on these are the kind of questions we need to look at. Super, Ria. Madeline. Thanks very much. Thank you. Brilliant. If you stop screen sharing now, Madeline, um, if we have questions, Mariana, do you want me to? Please, can you? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'll just go to the very beginning on the last. <laughs> everyone should. Um, sorry. Can everyone see that? I think they can. Sorry, let me just put my glasses on. I'll be good if I. Hang on a second. Um, this slide show. Perfect, perfect, Mariana. Excellent. Well, th thank you, Clodo, and thank you for the kind um, introduction and also for the warm invitation. And I say warm because I am melting here in Sydney. We've had an exceptionally um, warm summer and the humidity doesn't help. But um, greetings to you all, and I would have loved to have been there in person, but hopefully um, sometime during this year we'll be able to do that. So today I'm actually going to talk about Fial's journey and I'm going to try and tease out some of the elements that Madeline has touched on in regards to governance and how good governance can lead to some great results and impact for your members and your cluster. But before I start, I actually wear two hats. I'm actually the chair of the Oceana chapter of the TCI network down under. And we have just recently commenced um, a secretariat role and function because we're really ramping up activities. There are, there's a lot of interesting clusters in Australia, in the region. And so watch this space because we'll be um, having a conference in May, which I'll share the, um, the details of the conference later on. But also, as Clodo has said, I actually um, lead an organisation, what we call FIAL or Food Innovation Australia Limited, not FAIL. Um, and FIAL is actually quite an interesting organisation. We're a not-for-profit or entity that was established by the Commonwealth back in 2013 to really um, catalyse the growth of the, of the food and agribusiness sector in Australia. Um, so we operate as a cluster on a national level across one of the largest countries in the world, and yet we're not called a cluster. There are six growth centres, and each of the growth centres that operate as a growth centre are either of strategic importance to the Commonwealth or we have a competitive advantage. And so the, um, resources are being guided towards really driving the productivity and growth of those areas. So this is the country Australia, as I'm sure you're all familiar with. You heard a lot about it in the news recently. Um, so it is the sixth largest country in the world. And this country produces about three to four times 
the volume of food that Australia can eat domestically. Um, so we have a population around 25 million and we can feed with what we grow and produce about four times our population. And as you know, now we're more recently, we're also known and famous for the debacle of um, deporting the world number one tennis player, my fellow colleague from the former Yugoslavia or Serbia, Novak Djokovic. So in terms of my sector, um, I wanted to provide a bit of context because the context is really critical to understand why we exist and some of the challenges that we represent. So the food and agribusiness sector in Australia um, is represented by a lot of firms, and I'll talk about that um, in a second. But the focus for me is really the whole sector. Um, it's looking at all, all the imports that go into the outputs, the bread and other products that we eat. So it's really important that we, um, we look at the whole value chain. The challenge that we have in Australia is that agriculture, which are the inputs, report into one minister and the processing sector reports into another minister and the education sector reports into a, a third minister. So you can imagine the challenges of what uh, Madeline's talking about around governance and the triple helix that we had three different agendas across three different ministers and therefore investments not aligned. So my focus is on the whole value chain. So here are some statistics around the food and agribusiness sector in Australia. Um, the, the, sec the total sector is 59 billion um, Australian dollars. Um, which, which is approximately about 4% of gross domestic products in Australia. The sector employs collectively around 180,000 businesses and they employ over half a million people across the whole country, predominantly on the east coast of Australia, which is where most of the growing takes place. On the right-hand side are the food and beverage or the manufacturing um, um, data. And as you can see, it's a very small percentage of businesses that represent the value-add section, and, but they represent almost half of the people that are employed across the sector. And so one of the challenges that we have in our sector and a real market failure is that the industry is made up of a lot of small companies. So over you know, 90 percent of businesses are SMEs, either micro or small to medium sized enterprises. And that poses a lot of challenges for our industry in that we don't have the economies of scale across, you know, as Madeline said, around sharing, sharing resources, sharing knowledge, or the connections that we require to be successful. So as a result, we are really underrepresented across the sector in terms of what we commercialize. And so that's a real driver for us to get it right in terms of the market conditions, which is one of the reasons why we were established as a growth center. So what we do, and in terms of our overarching strategy is we were really established to really facilitate the bringing of people together, as Madeline said, around a common agenda or a common purpose and catalyze the growth of the sector. We work across these three platforms. You know, we believe if businesses have all the knowledge that they need, they'll make more informed decisions. We, need, we know that if they have the right capabilities, they can actually achieve anything, but they've got to be equipped with the right skill set. And finally, connections to funding, connections to researchers, connections to markets will allow them to then really deliver some real value for their businesses. So everything that we do has an element of these components in our programs. But as a growth centre, one of the key things that we need to do in terms of delivering this um, growth and catalyzing growth is what we call a sector competitiveness plan. And that's really the overarching vision for the industry. This vision um, in, um, guides the Minister of Industry's portfolio. So this sector outlines where are the priorities for the industry and also where the research areas that we need to focus on to unlock those priority growth areas. And the, and the Minister, invests and ensures that all the um, investment that he makes in his portfolio aligns to this sector competitiveness plan. This sector competitiveness plan is updated annually and I need to, I, I use my market intelligence that I glean from delivering activities across innovation and markets to inform the sector competitiveness plan. And I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but I do encourage you to go to it because it really does provide a bit of a, a guideline as to what what needs to happen for success. In this 
in the in the strategy, what we do is we link our milestones to this vision that's actually in the sector competitiveness plan, and we have a roadmap. And the roadmap links to key priority areas that we have to focus on over a period of 10 years. This was a 10-year strategy that we developed over back in 2013. And we are, every year we are held to account through reporting of our annual report to say how we're we progressing towards achieving these milestones. And the vision is really how do we work together to grow the share of Australian food in the global marketplace. So it really is important to have this vision, but then to develop your, your pathway and your, and your milestones to achieving this vision. And then you need to measure it to see how you're progressing. And what we have been doing every year is actually moderating this this roadmap because we've got intelligence, things are not working or we've had to change our approach. So it's really important to have that vision and, and, and which was set by the board in terms of the strategic direction for the sector. So I suppose you're wondering why clusters and how do we get to work on clusters? So um, yes, we've got the vision, but there's something fundamental and um, Madeline's touched on this. Um, we discovered clusters very early on in our journey, and I've and I'm just briefly touch on some of these elements of the journey. So we were incorporated in 2013, and one of the basic principles of how we operate is a spirit of collaboration and how we're very open and collaborative. And that is something that clusters is quite unique about. Um, the only Thing at the time, we actually didn't realise it was called, the word was called a cluster and a lot of the theory around clustering. And it was very fortunate that when I met Madeline um, a few years later, it all came into perspective in terms of the direction. So, you know, we recognise because Australia is a very large um, ecosystem, large geographical area, um, we've got a lot of cultural issues. We're a federation, um, we have states. They do, do not cooperate. We have a large number of SMEs. So there's a lot of market failures. And we and so we recognise that we created a lot of ecosystems, mini ecosystems across the country focused on a common purpose with all the right elements of the triple helix. That, and we gave them some support. We, we realised that they could help us to deliver on the vision and for, for the overarching sector for the country. And that's where the journey really began. We, we introduced the concept in 2015 to the federal government in Australia, and unfortunately, they didn't quite like the word cluster and they weren't really prepared to back it, but they liked the ideas that we were presenting. And in 2016, when I formally met Madeline, we actually went on a tour and visited a lot of cluster practitioners where, you know, the magic that I experienced when I went to the conference at TCI at the time really put things into perspective. Um, the challenge that we had we recognised we wanted to support um, other clusters to sit underneath FIAL across the whole country to really help us deliver on the strategy, but we had no money and we were fortunate enough to find some support. We launched a competition. Um, we were the first ones in the country to launch a competition. We had over 30 um, expressions of interest in the food and agribusiness sector, and we funded four clusters, which I'll touch on briefly in terms of the success of those clusters. We funded four clusters um, over a period of three years, gave them $150,000 per annum over three years to really accelerate their growth. And on the back of that, the federal government provided another $20 million to really encourage further um, investment in this area. Um, in 2020, uh, the, the federal government um, are starting to listen in terms of understanding the market failures in the country, and they launched a $1.4 billion uh, modern manufacturing strategy, in partly due to the pandemic and a lot of the natural disasters that we've had in Australia, such as bushfires and floods. And this was really to try and stimulate the manufacturing sector and food and beverage was one of the priority areas the Commonwealth is focusing on. And what was really encouraging in that strategy that clusters is underpinning the food and beverage roadmap and bringing that to life. And they used a lot of our work that we have done. So it's taken us many years, taken us seven years of talking to the Commonwealth, reporting on our results and our an impact that we're having for them to listen. And now they're investing in clusters. And last year, late last year, we just um, had another competition around clusters and we just announced another four winners of one-off projects 
across the country. So as you can see, you know, the journey of a cluster is a long time. Um, it takes us, it's taken us eight years to get to where we are. But as Madeline said, the priorities have changed over those eight years and we've had to pivot as a board and change the board over this period of time to reflect the different needs. So let me share with you some of the successes of what we've had. So I believe Emma Greenhatch um, from the Food and Agribusiness Network in Queensland, um, she presented last year for some of you who may recall, but Emma is one of our um, stars. Emma, um, this cluster was established in 2015-16 and they really were looking to transform in tropical North Queensland um, taking their fresh produce and value adding to it. They have a, a large community of people, the professionals who are market, marketeers, salespeople who have retired up there or moved there for lifestyle choices and they're wanting to give back. They're still young enough to, to wanting to work, but they also want to create an environment so that their children have a better life and prospects for employment. Um, Back when they um, started, they had very few members. Today, they have close to 400 members. But what's really exciting, they've just been awarded a Commonwealth grant through the Modern Manufacturing Strategy, which is a nearly $100 million investment to set up a beverage um, innovation manufacturing hub. And that hub would not have been possible if Emma had not been given the money to set up her cluster and to really drive the activities within her ecosystem. Another cluster in Tasmania, Ferment Tasmania, um, they have a very similar story. One also started in 2016. They have about, um, about 350 members, predominantly micro to small businesses, um, and, but they're looking to become the world leaders in fermentation technology and how do they help with them being a small island, they really need to differentiate some of their produce. And so they're looking at ways of how they can differentiate themselves and they want to create what they call a fermentation play, um, a little play, play area where companies could come in, try different technologies, be um, taught different things and really take their products to a new level. This is them celebrating. They just recently were awarded an $8 million um, investment through a grant scheme in Australia to start the process of setting up their fermentation hub. And that's once again, would not have happened if our seed money of helping that cluster um, deliver activities and also um, apply for grants. Just recently, they've also been awarded um, for UNESCO to become one of the gastronomy cities in the world. And so that's another kudos and feather in their belt. I will just briefly touch on, we're also working with the Indigenous people in, in Australia. So the Noongar Land Enterprise Group are looking at establishing um, an engagement model of how do you engage Indigenous people across the country without um, taking their IP and protecting their sacred knowledge and, um, um, and for making sure that the interests come back to the people of the country. And... Um, they've been quite successful in their engagement model and they're looking at setting up an incubator um, to accelerate um, the commercialisation of bush foods with the interests um, coming back to Indigenous people and their communities. And just recently, they've just um, um, IP'd some honey and set up the new enterprise in generating honey for their people. In terms of, as you can see from the examples that we've provided not only do we have a strategy we have a vision we have some clear milestones that we have to deliver over a period of time and over time we have delivered because we've delivered these on these milestones our funding has continued continued over the years so I've had five contracts with the Commonwealth over a period of um, eight years going on now into nine and by the way, I've also had five prime ministers and I've also had about 10 ministers. So it's been a quite an interesting journey. So the most important thing, and, and as Madeline said, um, they will hold you to account. Um, you know, it, if you say you're going to do something, then you try and aim to deliver on it. And it doesn't matter if you don't achieve it completely, but to getting close enough, um, because if you achieve your milestones, the rewards will come with it. So what are some of the hurdles that we've experienced on our journey um, in establishing clusters? 
Um, one of the things and observations that we found across the country that, you know, a lot of um, governments support technology, they support the building of equipment um, and establishing of equipment, but very few people provide support for the human capital, the soft infrastructure, as we would say, to set up a cluster. And so one of the things that, um, that I touched on earlier, we identified that clusters was the mechanism for really um, accelerating the transformation of the food and agribusiness sector in Australia. But unfortunately, the Commonwealth was not interested in funding the human aspect. And so um, finding ways of funding that human aspect, the soft infrastructure of a cluster is really critical. And you've got to be creative in the way you go about um, finding that source. All clusters suffer from self-sustainability. Everyone wants a cluster to be self-sustainable. And I, I think having that at the forefront of your mind, I think is important um, from a governance perspective that you do need to be self-sustaining because it does drive the right behaviours and the right business behaviours and the shrewdness in how you operate your bit organize, organization. But um, it does take time and it does have to be a shared relationship in terms of the support of a cluster. And, you know, there is a lot of um, theory that's been published, particularly through the catapult model that, you know, it should be, you know, typically a third of government, third of industry, a third from other sources. And I can just tell you now that um, the Food and Agribusiness Network on the Sunshine Coast that I touched on, they actually are now fully self-sustaining, they're into their sixth year and they are no longer, I mean, they're getting um, winning projects, but they're not um, reliant on government purely to operate their, their business. So this means that in, um, government plays a really critical role and one of the challenges that we've had with the Commonwealth is that they, one, they have short timeframes, so they, they either have um, if, if people are going to invest in something, they need to invest in it for a long term, typically five to 10 years, not a term of four or two years. So the role of government is critical and it ensures. So what it does is it signals to the industry that that's where we should be investing because the government's backing it and therefore they're going to support you. But secondly, um, also the role of a finance, financier. They actually also need to be part of it because a lot of the times um, when Australia had the bush summer um, black fire, we had some really bad fires, as you all would have seen, which devastated the country um, I and mean, the floods and all the government um, entities were leaning towards our clusters across the country. Why? Because the clusters were local, the clusters were well connected to the local communities, they understood the business needs, and they were able to deploy services and support to those in need at, at the most critical time. So the role of government is really critical in terms of um, signaling the direction and supporting, but also providing financial support too. Um, what, as Madeline has touched on, one of the things that we, we noticed, um, it's really easy to set up a cluster um, and it's easy to get some early wins, but what we found that as the cluster matures and as they grow on their journey, the skill set required for, to be on a board of a cluster is very different and, and it may not be the people who help set up the cluster. And so in response to the challenges that we were seeing our cluster um, grappling with, for example, we had board members interfering with financials and they were getting involved in, well, how was this invoice um, coded to this code? And it's like, that's ridiculous. How is a board member talking about invoices and payment of invoices? And why aren't they focusing on the direction that they need to in terms of setting the oversight of the strategic direction for the business? So um, last, uh, about 18 months ago, we actually ran a cluster director training course for the clusters in Australia. And we are currently revamping this course with Madeline. And we'll be delighted to do something with yourselves in terms of understanding how this cluster, um, how being on a board of a direct a director of a board of clusters is very different to a normal board. And in terms of what's next for us, um, we're continuing to drive change. Um, we, um, our ecosystem of clusters is delivering results. And just recently, we've applied to the Commonwealth to, um, as I've said, the Commonwealth is starting to use the language of clusters. 
and and that's really exciting. But we've just recently applied um, for a two hundred million dollar investment for a six hundred million dollar project to set up an ecosystem which currently does not exist in Australia, and it's really the food and beverage manufacturing innovation ecosystem based on clusters, so we can really transform and double the, the value of the sector going into the future. Um, just briefly, um, we have published a lot of our reports. So if you want to read a bit more about our insights to different markets around the world, please go to our website. I believe um, um, Claude can actually share my slides for those of you that would like to. Um, one of the other things that we do every year, we publish an innovation book for our sector. And the innovation book talks about the success of those businesses who have innovated. Um, the challenges and so forth. But in 2020, we actually wanted to focus on su the success of our clusters. So in this book, there are nine success stories of clusters in Australia, in the food and agribusiness sector, which you, they share their learnings and what they're doing to really punch ab about the weight and deliver some real value for our sector. And finally, I just wanted to touch on, we um, have got a conference into um, the TCO Oceana chapter is having a conference in Cairns this May. I'm not quite sure if um, people, um, people will be wanting to travel, but I think um, by that stage, I'm sure the Omicron's, um, the virus will be um, well under control and um, we'll be able to travel. So um, we hope to see you down under and details can be found um, if you just um, search TCO Oceana conference. 